Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Wednesday, November 17th, 2021 Worcester Township Board of Supervisors business meeting. Would you please join me in saying the Pledge of Allegiance? My name is Rick Delello. I'm the chairman of the board. To my left is Lou Betts, who's our vice chair. And to my right is Steve Quigley, who's our third member. Uh, over on the side tables, we have Tommy Ryan, our township manager, and Stacy Crandell, our assistant township manager, and Nicole, I'm gonna try to say this right, Quagliarello. It's close, I think. It's not identical, it's in the neighborhood, who's our finance director. Um, first and foremost, does anybody have any informational items for the board tonight? This evening's meeting is being video recorded for rebroadcast. Excellent, I have one informational item. I wanna take this opportunity to congratulate Lou Betts on um, six more years. I'm sure he may not like that in six months, but tonight, six more years. Congratulations, Lou. I also. I also, I don't see her in the audience, but I do want to take a moment to congratulate Amy uh, Smith for running. I, having run elections myself, I know how much time, effort, and work that is, so I, I applaud anybody who's willing to put their name on a ballot and run. Uh, the more people are involved, I think typically the better that is for the township. Moving forward, First item on our agenda is public comment. We do ask that you limit public comment to five minutes. We have a pretty full house tonight, so I'm sensing people might have something to say. So uh, public comment, anybody at this time? Kim? Hang on a second. Can you make sure that the mic is on there for you, Kim, or get that closer to you just so we get you on the recording? How about that? Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Um, you know, just wanted to say thank you for doing the open space initiative to preserve open space in our township. And, you know, wanted to ask how, how that's going, but also, you know, concerned about, is it going to be proactive in terms of what Stacy might be doing in terms of reaching out to you know, I, like for an example, on Whitehall Road, there's a track that just came up for sale. I think it's like 32 acres. I mean, would she try to contact that, you know, property owner and talk about open space initiative and what we can do to preserve it? I mean, is there going to be outreach with that program? So we had a presentation on it, which I think is on the website. But the short answer is yes. And the second answer is that's all still sort of being... Um, established in, in terms of what the right protocols might be. It's about, as we had talked about a couple of months ago, it's about getting some process and programs in place, and certainly one of those is outreach. You know, exactly how that happens. Look, transactions of that nature, there's a certain amount of discretion that needs to happen, so it isn't something that we are gonna announce in every meeting, hey, we're gonna go talk to this neighbor or that neighbor. There's a, a sort of a discreet quality that a lot of residents would like with regard to that sort of situation. But part of it is about, I think Steve said it in a meeting maybe two or three months ago, there isn't theoretically any property that there isn't an interest in if somebody is interested in preserving. You know, there's a variety of programs. They change, they evolve. Part of it is us trying to stay on top of that as best we can. So I don't know that I can fully answer the question other than to say that certainly yes. I mean, part of what we want to do in establishing sort of a, a sort of codifying a program is that we're reaching out to people to educate and see if there are opportunities. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, do you think there'll be, you know, pamphlets or literature developed by the township that can be distributed to, you know, possible property owners? So you're getting into the weeds a little bit there, Kim. Yeah. I mean, I, we haven't sat down and, and put together a, uh, you know, sort of a marketing budget that says, hey, let's print this or that. I mean, typically a lot of the stuff electronically, certainly we can produce things electronically to share and distribute, but we haven't reached a, a sort of a level of saying, hey, we'll have these pamphlets that everybody can hand out. Uh, so I can't really answer that at this point. Okay, well, I'm glad you're moving forward with it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Rick, maybe to put it to bed a little bit, 
we could say amongst the board there's been discussion about numerous properties in the township in the past past couple of months properties that could be available so we'll leave it at that so it's not that we're skirting the issue <laughs> we are involved so but as rick said we can't discuss really real estate matters with the public you just can't do that thank you anything to add we're, we're good. okay uh, anybody else have public comment for the board? Okay, so we're going to start in the front and we'll work towards the back. So, Sue, you're up. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Susan Smith. I grew up at Sobracio Farm at 3102 Fisher Road behind the Schwankfelder Church. Recently, I attended the open house held here on October 27th, where the comprehensive plan was being explored. As you know, there were well-organized tables asking for opinions of the residents in various areas of the plan. Really well done. The only disappointment, which was a large disappointment, was that it was not better attended by the residents of Worcester. I don't believe it was because of a lack of interest on the residents' part, I believe it was because not enough of them knew about it. I assume the township sent out an email or a newsletter to announce this, but it wasn't often enough to get the attention of the residents. In marketing, there's a well-known principle that a person needs to see an advertising message nine times before they actually get the message, before it sinks in. My concern is that they didn't hear the message often enough to get it. So. I have an idea. I know that sending out paper messages has a cost associated with it. To supplement announcements to the residents, why not attract, why not erect an attractive wood sign with slots for changeable letters and words right outside this township building? An attractive design in keeping with our rural ambience. I passed Mary Mead Farm the other day and I thought, yeah, Something like that. I have some examples I'll leave with you that I found on the internet, although I'm sure there are even nicer ones than these, than what I found in the limited time I had to research it. If I can further help with the design, I would welcome it. This attractive sign could announce special and or important upcoming meetings or events. Events like the Planning Commission's open house, the Worcester Historical Society's flea market, upcoming important zoning meetings, a firehouse fundraiser, Worcester days, things like that. It could also communicate informational messages. One important informational message might be to inform residents who are interested that they can preserve their property as open space as their legacy to Worcester. At a recent meeting, I believe I heard the township, that the township would like it if residents reached out on their own to the township about their property. From what I understand, there are several ways land can be preserved, and it would be helpful if the residents knew this. Perhaps it could be on the website. I looked on the website, I didn't see it. Uh, commenting, piggybacking on what Kim's comments were. In this case, the sign could rotate in with a message like this. Residents interested in preserving your property as open space inquire at info at worcestertownship.com or the telephone number or perhaps the worcestertownship.com link or some way for them to get in touch. Having a sign would greatly enhance the communication to residents. And after all, the township is here to serve the residents, right? As part of this service, why not use a beautiful sign to enhance communication with our residents? And I have these sheets I can hand to you. That's fine. We're happy to take them. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. I also just wanted to say that I was hoping to stay the whole time of the meeting today, but I have to pack for a trip tomorrow morning. So. Sorry, I won't be able to stay. That's Thank okay. you. We're glad you came. Thank you. Thank you. I know there was a, in the back, there was a, a hand that was up. Bert, sorry about that.
I just wanted to make a comment this evening. At last month's meeting, a significant amount of time was dedicated to talking about the open space plan for Worcester. And as a resident of this township, I was extremely gratified to hear the support from all three of our supervisors for the concept, the initiation of a plan. Uh, I heard things like open space is a priority, preservation is a priority in Worcester. I heard that this is a starting point and not an end point, all really good things. And I was very pleased to hear that, and I know a lot of other people were too. I also was gratified by the fact that you quantified what your plan is for open space by talking about uh, preserving an additional 300 acres in the next 10 to 13 years, uh, getting to the point where 20% of the township is actually preserved. And, and I, I don't know where the 20% came from, but it's a start. It's a starting point. Uh, I would hope that that is thought of by not just this board, but future boards as a minimum point, and that hopefully we can have preserve a lot more land than that. But I want to say thank you. I want to let, you, let folks know that you are listening to what is said by the residents here, and that you're hearing that preservation is valued in this township. So thank you, and keep up the good work. Thank you. Bert, a follow, Bert, a follow up to your question or comments is that I also have the privilege of sitting on the county farm board. And probably the, when you talk about buying open space, the county averages in a neighborhood of probably twelve dollars to $15,000 to, to buy an acre of ground. That's not a whole lot of money. So I think it's important for those folks interested in Worcester preserving open space, they need to start looking at how do I want to help that out. So I think the township manager and the assistant manager, uh, I guess, are willing for open space monies. It's when you go, we go, the farm board present a property to be purchased, we have an, a dollar value. And a lot of times the family says, love to do it, but not enough money. There's a misconception, I think, about from a lot of people in Worcester, is that we can sweeten the pot. If the county offers $13,000 an acre, Worcester can't come up with $15,000 more per acre to sweeten the pot. The county and the state, they don't do it that way. The amount of the appraisal is the amount of the appraisal. So I guess what I'm trying to say is it's incumbent upon the township as well as the residents that are really interested in this project, they have to start contributing to an open space fund. It just can't be the, the township money uh, in conjunction with the state and uh, the other money available. So it's, it's not easy. We had a couple of really nice properties in Worcester that the Farm Board was looking at in the past two or three years. The numbers didn't add up. They said, you know, we love to do that, but we have to look at our children and the inheritance and the things associated with that. So we are looking at that. This is one of the main things we're trying to do is to establish a so-called bank account for open space where the residents who are really interested in it are willing to contribute to it as well. So uh, that's an issue that we have to really address. We're trying to do that through the township so there's no misrepresentation of the bank account and the money going into it. And we can keep a track and, you know, as Susan mentioned about a sign, to have a sign out there with a goal. And this is our goal for open space for a year. And we can, you know, bank on that. As Rick alluded to the real estate things, we are looking at properties, but, you know, we have to be responsible with the money we have that we just can't spend it all on open space. You know, there's, there's budgets, there's roads, bridges need to be fixed, as well as the maintenance in the township. So we can budget a certain amount and maybe the residents can match that somehow. So it's an ongoing situation, but I just wanted to stress that people in the township have approached the county about preserving their properties and it just wasn't enough money in the kitty and they, they turned away on that. And hopefully the, product, the properties won't be developed and maybe we can revisit that. So the township does have a list of a number of properties that we're working on. So thank you. Okay, well thank you, Steve. Uh, I appreciate that information as well, and I, I'm sure that everyone who's listening uh, will also appreciate hearing that. 
Uh, the fact is you're, you're looking forward, all three of you, and looking at how you can preserve, how you can do the best you can, and sometimes the numbers don't work. And, and I think everyone understands that. But as long as you take the approach that you're going to be proactive and do the best you can with it, that's all we can ask. So thank you. Thank you, Bert. Appreciate it. <coughs> Is anybody... Hi, my name is Cindy Smith, closely related to Susan. Um, I am uh, really glad that you supervisors are continuing uh, the dialogue and, and consideration of open space by preserving properties in Worcester, including the farm that my family owns on Fisher Road. The farmhouse there was built by Peter Wentz in 1744. It is the oldest house I've ever been in. And I think that we have to keep that in mind about Worcester is the historical significance of this township. You know, the other Peter Wentz farmhouse that you know, the Peter Wentz farmstead, Montgomery County bought that and turned it into a museum because General Washington stayed there. And you know, who knows, maybe George Washington rode a horse across the Palmer property, which is not too far from the farmstead. And I think we have to think about the historical significance of the property that uh, is being threatened right now uh, to have all 55 acres developed commercially. In Europe, you can't even put a shovel in the ground without an archaeological assessment of the area to find out what's in those fields. And I would ask you to consider an assessment be made of that property before any development were to happen. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Do you want to touch that one? I'll, uh, I'll touch it, and if I miss something, you can help me out. OK. <clears throat> A little education for you folks here. Uh, I think the Palmers probably, it's not a new project, the Palmers. Probably back in the 90s, they started on this for the letters the supervisors have been getting saying, hey, you know, you got to stop this. We don't believe in this. We believe in that. The Palmer family has been probably putting uh, letters to the township, probably going on close to 30 years. And um, there been negotiations back and forth. We had a, someone mentioned a comprehensive plan. I'll go back eight or 10 years ago. Uh, the people at the time running the township, as well as the planning commission, and some other groups in the township, wanted to create villages in Worcester, three villages, one in Cedars, one here in this village, and one down in Center Point. And the Montgomery County Planning Commission got involved in it as well. And to make a village, you need people. And I questioned some of the people involved in the project, saying, where are the people going to come from? You know, I'm associated with Murraymead Farm, and there's not many neighbors that live around Murraymead that actually walk to Murraymead. They drive. So when you create a village, where are these people in Worcester really going to walk to? If you put a village in, and it's a hair, hair place there or a furniture place, are you gonna drive or walk to get your hair done? Most women, I think, drive to get their hair done. They don't usually take a walk and their hair gets all messed up. For most shops, to go to the grocery store, you need things to carry and you need a car to transport it. Those things being said, I myself questioned it, the whole village concept. You can't build a village. Skip back is a village. There's shops there, there's stores there, there's homes there where you can transfer from a business to a home or vice versa. So I guess it was the township that initiated, in conjunction with the Palmers, the development of that property. Palmers came in with a plan, and the plan detailed a number of acres being left for open space with the commercial land in front. It went back and forth for a number of years in conversations here. And I guess there's, does anyone here I'll ask this question. Do you folks know what TDRs are? You don't know what TDRs are? I'll help you with what a TDR is. A TDR is something called transferable development rights. It's where the property and the township, in fact, I sat here 15 years ago with the Worcester Golf Course. The residents packed this room, 
hired lawyers to tell the township they didn't want houses on that property. I sat here for two and a half years watching the negotiations going back and forth regarding that property for the TDRs. The owner of the property never had any intention to build homes on that. It was a charade for these TDRs. The TDRs would be transferred off that property and put somewhere else. The people in the township wanted the TDRs to go to Palmer's property. So Palmer's had could build X amount of homes. They would transfer those TDRs from the golf course to keep the homes on the golf course down to center point. And this was a negotiation by the people in the township working on both sides to come up with this transferable development right program where you would put more houses on the Palmer property. We got the County Planning Commission involved in it. They looked at the other properties in Center Point. Uh, I believe the Bryan property on the right-hand side across from Worcester School. There could have been upwards to 50 to 100 townhouses there. I forget the actual number, as well as some other properties in Worcester. So this isn't something, I, I, I guess, new to the township. These were meetings that were well, well advertised but you know, people get notices and the fire's lit, the communication goes out and the people show up at a meeting. But I've been here, I think probably for 15 or 16 years, every Wednesday night listening. So I, I know the history with the items going on here. This is something that just started. It's been an ongoing negotiations by people on all sides. And I say that because we the supervisors now sit here with no essentially power at all, the lawyers for the Palmers have gone around the bend, gone to the zoning hearing board to get clarification on the zoning. And I think that's important to understand that, that the property is not, the property is already zoned. They're asking the court for clarification of the zoning on the property. I believe, Mr. Ryan, you can help me out. You've been doing this a little bit longer than I. The property, if interpreted by the county or by the, the judicial system, they're saying, are we allowed? Because the law essentially says we can put a research center in there, we can put a medical research center in there, we can put a number of items on that property. It's already zoned that way. They're asking for the court for clarification on that. So we, the township, the three supervisors here, our hands are locked. We, we have to sit here, it's in the court right now, and I, I essentially, did I sum up pretty good, Mr. Ryan? You can add some stuff to that? No, you summed it up very well. So we, we sit here now. We have no, we appreciate the letters people are sending us about stopping the Palmers. It's, it's really out of our hands right now. It's in the, between our zoning hearing board and the Montgomery County court system. And as I said, the Palmers had a, they had a plan and it was changed a couple of times with the urging of buying these TDRs and the number went up. And I, I believe that's how the number got inflated and moved along. So this whole village concept, I don't believe it was the Palmer's idea. It was a plan hatched by Montgomery, or could be the Worcester Planning Commission to turn our quaint little villages into real villages. And I, I just didn't know that was going to happen. I questioned at the time the village of Cedars. I said, how are you going to make it walkable? On Cedars, on the one side of the road, this side of the road, there's all homes. Well, we can put sidewalks behind those homes. I said, I live in Cedars. I don't want a sidewalk there. What, are you going to put bridges across the backyards of all these people? But the people at the time in Worcester, not long ago, were pushing these issues. But that's part of the problem, I think, Rick. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's so we've received some letters from folks telling us that they appreciate that we've taken a stance um, as the township sort of defending our current zoning that's in place there. But ultimately, they took it to a legal place. They took it to the, some of the letters didn't seem to understand that, in essence, we've been sued. It's not we're not having a negotiation with the Palmers on this particular item. They put forth the legal term as a substantive challenge to our zoning and said, well, we think we can do X, Y, and Z. We don't think that 
you can stop us from doing that. And that's why it's gone before. And they have the choice. They could have taken it straight to a court or they can present it at our zoning hearing board, which acts as a quasi-judicial um, board. They chose to go to the zoning board. It's within their province to do that. But ultimately, as Steve is saying, we're not having a negotiation with them invariably on that particular topic. It's, it's running through the court system. And it has a long history. I was on the planning commission when it came through the planning commission for uh, a period of time, and it had a lot of rewrites and a lot of things. Um, at the end of the day, I, I understand you know, that there's a desire to, of a lot of residents to do something particular with that property. Um, the, as a board, you know, that's right now we can't touch it quite the way that I think folks would like us to, um, invariably. But you know, again, we appreciate the position, but it's not, I think there's some misunderstanding as to kind of where it is and why it's in place there right now. And, and there's a little bit of now waiting to see how it plays through the court system. Now we've seen that in other places within the township over the past years, when you leave it to the courts, you know, that's, you, you relinquish some power and control because it's with the courts and the courts will ultimately make a determination and then we'll have to make a decision based on that or the Parmas will have to make a decision based on that um, ultimately. But it's, it's a little bit of a tricky situation for us as a board because ultimately we're not, we, you know, we, we're not empowered to do some of the things it feels like we're being asked to do with regard to that particular item. Rick, I think the other thing is, is that we need to make the people aware of that we, the board, really can't communicate with you folks out there. It's, it's, in, a, it's in a legal battle right now, right. and people want to talk to me about it, and really I can't. The, the legal system set up for checks and balances, the conversations can't take place. Um, if it does, we don't want to jeopardize a court ruling, and the lawyers on both sides are very good. The township um, we have a budget every year, and we budget so much money for legal fees. We far exceeded that already in about five months. So the township is, we are hearing what the neighbors are saying. We've instructed our um, oh, lawyer, yep. Mr. Brandt, that's working on it, and maybe someone, if you're going to stick around for the budget, I'm sure Mr. Ryan can share how much we've exceeded the budget already, excuse me, the, the quarterly balance for uh, the legal bills. We, we've spent a lot of money, of taxpayers' money already, and we haven't even started anything yet. I mean, it's just been negotiations. Paperwork, Mr. Ryan, would you say? Yeah, so the uh, testimony before the Zoning Hearing Board has yet to begin. Uh, we're with uh, motions in the Court of Common Pleas right now, but as we sit here tonight, uh, just on this application alone, uh, the township uh, uh, solicitor legal bills total $76,000. And How much was that again? Seventy-six thousand. Seventy-six thousand dollars in a couple of months. And so uh, it, the, it's just, and we're sitting on the sidelines. Just it's just paperwork going back and forth. There's been no testimony, testimony yet. It's just paperwork between lawyers going back and forth, and either the township or the landowner pays that bill to the people. So the township is doing their due diligence. We have the legal team in place to fight for the residents of the township. So be aware of that that we are doing our due diligence. We are spending money to fight on your behalf to do the best thing we can for the township. But as Mr. Lello said, that just to back it up, that we're, we're sort of out of the loop. You know, we, we sit here, and I guess the thing we can do is we can challenge the outcome. That's the, the next step right. for the board. Right or wrong, however it comes down, our next step would really not accept the ruling of Montgomery County Court. Right. Right, and we saw that for those who know some of the history of Center Square Golf Course, there was, you know, that was a legal challenge and it went back and forth and eventually there was an opportunity to, um, to resolve it um, ultimately at the end of the day. But it, when it gets into the court system, there's certainly some challenges uh, that we're faced with as a board in terms of where that line gets drawn. I mean, look, in a perfect world, it, it, gets, it, it gets used and utilized in a way that the Palmers are happy and then the residents are happy. I mean, I think that was always the intention. It just didn't quite get there. Um, for a variety of reasons, it didn't quite get there, and then they decided to move in a different direction, and I'm not begrudging them that. I mean, I think there was a lot of good faith effort on both sides for multiple years to try to come to some, you know, some path forward that made sense, and it just didn't get there. Um, right, and I think, just to finish up, Mr. Lello, that Mr. Lello and I, 
as Mr. Mr. Betts, had no conversation about this. Just hearing the comments from the residents that they're already, we just want to make you aware of it. We had to, once again, we could say more about what's going on, but we really can't. We don't want to sway the judge or the the lawyers on either side by we hey the supervisor said this, the supervisor said that. So we're really stuck in just a listening mode at this point. So thank you. Okay, so we drifted a little on that, but back to public comment. Um, uh, does anybody else have public comment at this time for the board? Over here. Good evening. Harriet West. I'm from Adair Drive. Um, my concern is the Adair Drive storm water project that took place. Um, I've lived there for 30 years. We were flooded inside of our home four times. Sorry. Is that better? Okay. So. That's all right. You're good. We just want to get. We've been in there for 30 years. Um, we've been flooded in our home four times. Township always said when we confronted them, it wasn't their problem. So finally, my husband and family members took matters into our own hands. We put our own drainage pipe in, had our property to where we didn't get any more water. You, th you would think I had a river behind my house. That's how much water we got. So we took it into our own hands and done it. So the township then, 26 years it took this township to decide to fix the problem. We decided to allow them to come onto our property to help the other residents because all of the Dare Drive is affected by this, not just me. So we allow them to, with regard that it is going to fix the problem. However, I'm right back to square one. We've sent several emails over the last couple months to the township supervisor and the board to come out and look at what happened. Nobody's come to see oversee this project when it was happening. So the effectiveness of the completed project and some of the imperitable, irreparable changes and deprecations that have been made to our properties, we know that we know that one, there's many steps to planning such projects of this magnitude, but, is, but it is very disappointing that nothing more than a mold, small scale engineering overview plan of this project was offered to the homeowners prior to the start of this project. I think that we should have all had a meeting and let us know what was gonna take place. Our property value has been depreciated. Nobody would buy our property, it looks hideous. There are inlets in the yards, which should not have ever been. We didn't know that. They should have been in the street. The water flows on the street. Yes, we get water in the yards, but if all of these inlets would have taken place on the street, where they belong, it would have minimized the yard water, and the regular water that goes into the yard, we would have gotten. You need to come out and look at this mess. It is disgusting. If we were to put our homes up for sale right now, nobody would buy them. It looks ridiculous, and we're stuck with this. I can't even use my yard. My whole yard is a swamp. It's like walking on quicksand, every part of my yard. To get my trash cans, to walk to our garage, we have to go out on the street, go up to the upper driveway to walk into our garage. We allowed this township to come on our property and they've destroyed it. Sent several emails to Tom Ryan. I was called a liar. I pay him. Where does he get off calling me a liar? That is not, not, that's not acceptable. No township official should call a tax paying resident a liar. In turn, because of this project, my home got fecal matter back up due to the pumping station failure on Adair, Adair Drive because the mud from this project compacted that pumping station. I was told that was a lie. 
I called and got the, I didn't get the records, but I got the confirmation. I got pictures and I got videos of all of the men that were at this station for four and a half hours to unclog it. Five days I couldn't use anything in my home. Everything backed up inside. No showers, no toilets, nothing. I had to have somebody come professionally clean my home because I was told by Tom Ryan, it's not his problem. It was my problem once again. So I took care of it and I paid to get my home fixed. But I do not appreciate being called a liar by nobody that I put a paycheck in their pocket for. It works for me. You don't get to call me a liar. If I'm telling you something's happened in my home, I put an email out that night. The next day, Monday, Tom Ryan never called me. Finally, three o'clock, I called him to tell him that I had this in my home. He hung up on me. He told me, Mrs. West, I called the Storm Storm Authority. I said, hi, Tom, how was your day? How was your vacation, your, I'm sorry, your holiday yesterday? Mrs. West, I'm not gonna do this. I said, no, Tom, how was your holiday? Because mine was pretty crappy. Besides all that, we need to have this storm. So let me stop you right there on a couple of things. So if there are specific issues that you have regarding this, if you feel that we have done something incorrectly, if you feel that there's the step at this point would be a claim, an insurance claim, if you feel that we have. So we disagree. To be candid, some of the information that you're sharing today, we respectfully disagree in terms of the amount of communication we made on this project, the, account, the amount of effort that went into this project that scans multiple years, not a couple of weeks, and the amount of communication. We disagree on some of those elements, which is, which again, I don't want to get into a, a back and forth on that other than just to respectfully say I, I, we hear you. We don't agree on some of those items. If you feel that the township, the process would ultimately be if you feel that the township has done something here, you've, you've communicated that you don't like the job that was done and you feel that we've caused some damage to your project, to your yard specifically, you've made those claims. Ultimately, it would be about filing a claim with our insurance carrier in order to, to address that particular item and they would assess. They would assess the information that you have, they would assess the information that we have to make a determination as to whether or not that would be a viable claim. Ultimately, that's why we have insurance. When there's a disagreement on, on a matter, something like this, that would be the next step in terms of that. Where, where the inlets went and didn't went and why they went there, there was an exhaustive engineering um, and township process to arrive at that point that took, it predates when uh, Tommy was even the township manager. It goes back several years. Uh, Joe, Joe Nolan's not here tonight. He's uh, unfortunately under the weather, um, so he's not here tonight. But ultimately, he was a part of a lot of those discussions. There were discussions, ultimately. Um, but again, where we're at is you're saying we're not satisfied. We don't think what you did was appropriate. I feel that I have now damage on my property that was the result of the actions and activities that took place that you did. So we're saying, okay, the next step is then for you to take the step of filing a claim that we can then pass along to our insurance company in order to determine, they make a determination on something like that, ultimately to decide if that's in fact the case. But that's kind of where that is. Uh, we've asked many times um, to specifically document items if you feel that they were done wrong. Um, we we ultimately don't think we made mistakes there. Um, there's disagreement on that. I understand that. So that's where, ultimately, that's where we are, Harriet, is that it is you're saying, hey, I, I think you're wrong. So we're saying, okay, that's fine. The next step is, is filing an insurance claim uh, relative to that, ultimately. So that's what all the residents that are dissatisfied have to do. We have to all file if they a feel that If they feel that we have specifically taken an action that is now causing damage to their property with this particular project, yes, it's not a case of saying, hey, I just don't like what you did. But if there's, you know, in terms of you made some references to some specific things on your property, I don't, I don't wanna to speak to the other residents uh, directly on that, I'm talking to you. Uh, you. You've made some specific accusations, and and by all means, what we're saying is, hey, if that's kind of where you feel that this is, like, there's no reason for us to sort of disagree back and forth. It's saying, hey, this is the next step that then needs to happen there, and to make it a determination ultimately. Okay. Miss West, just to follow up I, I, with Rick, I I'll agree with Rick that this is like running a business that. 
I hate to say that your insurance company runs your business, but a lot of times your insurance company runs your business. So we have to follow the proper steps. If there's a disagreement, if somebody has an accident on your property, you call your insurance agent and say, listen, can you be the arbitrator here and come up with a conclusion? They're not a employee of the township. You're there for this purpose, that if there's a question or a dispute between the township and a resident, it goes to the insurance company. We pay our insurance premiums for this reason. If there's a dispute, the insurance company will come in and hopefully look at the situation and rectify the problem and give us a unbiased answer as to what needs to be done. So I don't think Rick is trying to pass it off in any way, but we have to follow the procedures there. So we'll follow up on that and make sure something happens. This is an investigation. Thank you. Thank you. Donna Kosmala, West Adair Drive. Um, basically following up with what Harriet just said, um, I have lived on Adair Drive for 42 years and never really had any water issues until the sewers were put in around the early 2000s. Uh, the water problem affects all the residents on Adair. And I've tried several times to explain the flow of the water and I felt like my comments were disregarded. Um, I also had more of a water problem when the neighbor up the street put pipes underground diverting his water down to me. Now I understand the issues, I have to go after the neighbor, which I don't agree with that, but I understand it. Um, I spoke to Joe Nolan when he was on a dare drive in July of 2019, speaking to other residents, and I asked him if it would solve my problem, and he basically told me that it wouldn't solve the problem for everybody. So then I got the map, I believe it was June of 2021, and I spoke to Tommy, and he said that it would do a lot. So from what I've seen, and I have looked at these inlets so much, I am sick of looking at them. Uh, we have taken pictures, videos. I personally have none on my property. It's just that the water is coming down from west of Dare, and it's going all the way down to east of Dare, Inlets are up at the corner by the stop sign on West Adair. Water never laid there. So I don't understand where this plan, uh, how this plan was devised, that these inlets just look like they were just put wherever. They should have been in the roads and not in the grass. And also, um, Really, I think it would have been better if nothing had been done because it's the, the, my property value probably will be devalued too if people look to buy a house around there and they see these big inlets in the ground. It just, it looks horrible. The, the properties are muddy. And seriously, I would like to know because of the way this project was done, will only parts of the road be paved next year? because it seems like we get patches of things instead of things done, you know, inlets here, inlets there. They could have been on the road on either side, and I know I'm not an engineer, but if they were on either side going down the road, it would have been less, in, less inlets, and it probably would have solved a lot of problems. So I, I just, that's all I can say. I'm not happy with it because I was hoping that we would have been given a chance to give some input because we know the way the water flows. And I don't believe anyone came out when it was raining to see the water. I just think it was a plan that was devised based on, I don't know what, because residents weren't asked about this as far as I know. So I think if it had been done correctly, meaning that they were put in the actual road that the cars drive on and not the grass, I think that we would, we would have not had a problem. And Joe Nolan has been here through many 
boards, many supervisors. I mean, I think he could have done better. Okay. No else to say. <laughs> um, again, we respectfully disagree a little bit. Oh, on I know. That. Yeah, it, I know. And, and ultimately, in terms of the location of the inlets, so we don't have curbing on Adair Drive. So this is one of the items that I looked into because uh, the question did get raised about why were they in the right of way, not on the actual, they're sort of off the, off the road. And it's because your, your goal, <laughs> one of your goals is, is getting all the water off of the road. And getting it off of the road, you ultimately are capturing it in the inlets off the road. That's, that's the engineering behind that. Again, I'm not an engineer, okay? So I have to rely on the professional engineer and the advice that we get as a board on that. And we're, I asked a lot of questions. I know Steve asked a lot of questions on, on this project. It came up before us multiple times across multiple, it predates me on the board. It started well before that, but certainly we went through two cycles of grant attempts, couldn't get a grant for it, so we, we just footed the bill for the whole thing because it was a project that we thought was important. And again, I, I understand what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. We're just not in full agreement on that today. I, but it's... I understand. I wish that you could come out and look at it. And honestly, if you could tell me that you would want this in your neighborhood or on your property, it's really disgusting. It looks like people just threw inlets wherever they felt like throwing them. They're not placed up by the stop sign. I never saw water laying up there. 42 years I've lived there. Never saw water on west of Dare by Germantown. Never saw water of the next one coming down on a Dare by Germantown. Never saw water on the other one. They're in places that make no sense. And putting them in a yard, it, 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 I know, I know, but I swear I think, I think sometimes engineers miss certain classes because this really does not make sense to me. Appreciate your comment. Thank you. Rick, if I can make a comment, it, it's like, to me, when I look at this situation, it's like your Perkiam and Bridge. If you saw the big floods we had, all that water that came from the Perkiam and Bridge that went over the Perkiam and Bridge that went in the Kaiser Miller Ford dealership up seven, eight feet, didn't come from that area, it came from up north. And I think we, the supervisors, see this all the time with water erosion problems that we're having in the township. Every time a development comes in, not only here, I witnessed and I drove around in the storm, water was coming from our neighboring townships, flooding into our township down the roads. Worcester is caught in the, the history of the past where we don't have curbs, a lot of the roads, we don't have sidewalks, we don't have street lights, the roads aren't wide. <laughs> uh, so we get the letters from the people, we move to Worcester for X, Y reasons, and they love it, the, the ruralistic nature of Worcester. We don't want sewers in Worcester, and would sewers come to the taking away the water? So we sit here, and I've been through three different sets of boards now, and becomes a, a, a juggling act. There's people that want sewer, there's people that don't want sewer. There's water erosion problems. How do you handle it? Where do you put the water? In neighboring townships, they have sewer. They have these drains that can carry the water through the roads and out it goes. Worcester, our problems are, a lot of our roads, maybe county roads, uh, the county comes in or the state and they just mill it and pave it. So the, ro the, the road is higher than the, the properties now and that becomes an issue. So where's the water run? It runs on the people's properties. We fight with PennDOT, we fight with the county and say, hey, we have water problems. Uh, that's your problem. But it's the resident's problem. So I understand what you're saying. We'll look at that and come up with some kind of solution. But it's, water is a tough issue. Um, and every year, with more and more homes that people are concerned about, it causes more water problems. The way to take care of it is sewer. But the problem with sewer, when you start running the pipes, the guy down the road who has 15 acres says, you know what, there's sewer there. I can now connect to that. So every action has a reaction. So, it, and the developers look for things like that. And that's one of the things Worcester prides itself on being that rural community. But when we start breaking those barriers down and putting sewer in to take care of the water, development comes with that. And it's one of the things we've put off for a number of years by not having sewer. And it's just an issue that we've, we've talked about and dealt with over the years. So I appreciate you coming out Thank and we'll, we'll look into it. I seriously hope that this would help, and I had some kind of hope that it would, because I figured they're up the corner. Um, I didn't know where exactly they were going to be placed on properties up there, but the water starts up there behind the trailer park in that area, and I figured it, they would collect some of the water there, but it's still not doing it. The water goes across the church, 
around the back. It comes straight down west of Dare. It, I don't see how they're going to work. And then once the road's paved, are there going to be little dips and things to make the water run where it has to run? I mean, I don't, it doesn't make sense to me. So. Can I say something? Yeah. Sure. By all means. All right. I hear what you've said. You, you've lived there, you say, 30 plus years? 42. 42 years. And you've known your water issues since that many years. Did it get worse after the septic lines were put in? You yes. You mentioned that earlier. It got worse when the septic lines were put in. It got worse when the neighbor, uh, three houses up from me, redid his yard about six times and ran pipe underground. He has the pipe going into the right of way. It's on his property, but it's in the right of way, and the water comes down the street. So it hits the three houses below him and the house next to me. And we've had some big rains lately, but my question is, is and just knowing the area a little bit, it comes off Germantown Pike, it does run down behind that church. Yeah. And there's a, there's a collection box at the back of that church. Now, that was, has water always stayed there, or is it collected back there? Or? The water runs across the trailer park, and it stays, as you're looking at the church, it's on the right side of the church. The pipes are on the left side of the church. Actually, after these were first put in, I went by and there was a, a huge puddle over on the right side of the church. They weren't put in the right places. But did water collect there in the past? Like, did it just pull up like a big retention basin before the sewers were put in? Water always collected it, there. It always collected back there? All right, so. uh, yeah, I believe it did because I'm trying to think back. It's been a long time, but I believe it did before the storm Drains were, the sewers you mean were Storm playing? sewer versus the septic yeah. sewer. Storm so. sewers definitely made it worse. So 40 years ago, it wasn't as bad as it wasn't was. It wasn't as now. bad, no. I mean, we had just the normal rain. We do get a lot of, there's a lot of underground water in that area. Yeah. You, know, you get water in the basement, you get water in your crawl space. It, it's just, there's, but people diverting and then, you know, I know when they did the sewers, that changed the flow of the water. And then the neighbor who diverts, he has a problem in his property with water. He actually should have gotten some drains behind or inlets behind his property, but he probably wouldn't have allowed that because all that water's coming from somewhere up on Germantown Pike by the Mascaro property, I believe, yeah. and coming to those houses there. And then everybody else is just dealing with it, but then he did the diverting of all the water, and it just makes more water for the rest of right. us. And they're down the end, so they're getting everybody's water from both sides. Now you understand, so you've mentioned your neighbor a few different times, and you understand, and again, people don't like this answer. I know. The township has no authority I know. on a neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor situation, none at all. The laws couldn't be more clear that we can't touch that. I can't come to your neighbor and say, hey, you need to do something. You're now putting water into your neighbors. It, it, it's a neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor dispute, and it winds up going down to the local judge who would rule on that, ultimately not us. We don't have the authority to do it. It's, it, I, and again, one of the answers nobody likes that I ever give them is that's just not something we're empowered to deal with directly, just and, on that particular item. I, and I understand that. It's just that I was hoping that this would help. Right. And I was also hoping that he would be reasonable and do something that he, you know, would not allow this to happen. But I really hope that this would help. Okay. Even though these things were up the street you know, in weird places, <coughs> but we've had um, the hurricane, you know, that's one thing, but we've had rain after that, and it's not helping. The water's still coming down west of Air Drive on my side. The water is still laying in the same places. I've looked at these inlets, the water's laying next to it. It's not going in it. I mean, they had covers on them. Well, some of them had covers on them. Covers on them? They hadn't, the, the inlets, there's a, there's a whole approval oh, process on the inlets, so the covers hadn't been taken off on some of them, which I think has now been corrected. Tommy, I mean, I'm not sure where we are with that. And again, I don't So the inlets were covered until such time as the site was stabilized, and okay. we were required to do that by DEP, so soils and, uh, you know, so don't I, wash into the system. So the site uh, was deemed stabilized late last week, and the covers were removed in the last uh, day or two. So that's one of the other, but again, like some of it is, it, we hear what you're saying. We hear, I think Steve said it, if there's areas that we can help, we can. There's a lot of things we can't help on. Um, I, I don't have a perfect answer for you on that, but we certainly appreciate the comments. We appreciate you coming out. It's, I know it's not always easy to get to the meetings. It's not always easy to share. Um, if we can, if there's things we can do, we certainly want to be able to do them. Well, Rick, I, th I think it's an important point you, that Tommy just brought about the covers. Right. 
about DEP, you know, you do these things, you try to follow the, the letter of the law, and there's regulators that come out, and Big Brother's always watching you, and he said, hey, Kay, if you, you dig this dirt up, you have to do this, you have to leave the covers on, this has to be done, that has to be done. Uh, I think Rick mentioned about, it always seems maybe a little easier, but Tom, you had discussed before in previous meetings about the, the law on the water. What's, what, what's the government say about water flow? Uh, with regards to private property? Private property. Right. Yeah, there's, um, in Pennsylvania, there's a, considered a, a common enemy doctrine when it comes to stormwater flowing across private property. And the courts, in short, have recognized that gravity will require water to flow downhill. And uh, everyone has a uh, shared and common uh, effort to maintain and control stormwater on the property. Generally, uh, property um, higher can allow water to flow through its natural course to properties below. Uh, what a homeowner can't do is to concentrate stormwater on his or her property in such a way uh, that it discharges uh, an increase in velocity uh, or volume uh, directly to somebody below uh, outside of the natural course of water uh, that causes damage. If that happens, uh, that's the decision uh, made by a judge in the Court of Common Pleas. Uh, as uh, was noted a few minutes ago, it's not a township issue, it's a matter between the affected property owners. You know, sitting up here, we're all neighbors. We're, you know, we're, we're just someone that ran for office and sit here, we sit here, and try to decipher the information regarding laws and regulations, much like the property we talked about before. We can do some things and other things we can't do. We, the law dictates to us what we can and cannot do because if we do something, such as the erosion problem, there's always somebody on the other side of the fence said, well, you did that, you acted illegally, and DEP gets involved with it, and they'll recite the law, as Tommy just said, that the natural flow of water, it, it, it is what it is. We can't change that. As much as we like to help people, we have to look at all the situations and follow the law, I, I guess, essentially. And we have professionals that, as you said, you're not an engineer, we're not engineers. We try to hire an engineer that knows the water flow, the, the regulations and things. If that comes into question, that's something we can deal with. But I, I think that maybe comes back to the recommendation of the insurance company. If the insurance company sees the flaw there, then we have to look at the situation and say, how did this happen? Why did it happen? And then that's where we, as elected officials, have to say, this has to be fixed and rectify the problem. So it's an ongoing situation. But as I said, we're here as neighbors and friends trying to be the, the, the judges, I guess, in a, a court case. And we try to do the best job we can without letting our, our friendships get involved in it. And it's tough sometimes when you have neighbor issues. It's, it's not easy. And you, you just try to do what's right. You try to balance the good, the bad, and the ugly, and come up with the, the best situation for all the township residents. I just wish you would come out and say, I know you may not be able to do that. I just wish you could come out and actually see it. I mean, if someone would come out there and tell me that this is normal, I might buy it. But I don't believe it's done this way in other townships, with or without sidewalks. I, I drive around now, I'm looking at inlets. Right. And, I, and they're in the road. I mean, I don't believe that they're in people's yards. And I just was really hoping that because this was going to finally be done, they would be in the road. I know I'm beating a dead horse here, but I just thought they'd be in the road and that would solve the majority of the problems. You probably would have had to put less in than 26. It just makes no sense to me. And I, I mean, just because someone's an engineer doesn't mean they know what they're doing. We've seen that over the years, how people build bridges and they collapse because nobody wants to be told they did the wrong thing. Right. And I just really... You know, he's been a common thread in this township with things that have gone wrong. And I've also had issues with him when the sewers were put in. Okay. So I, I do need to catch you. I need to go. I know. I, I do appreciate <laughs> Thank you for coming out. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Does anybody else have any public comment for the board? Good evening, Jeremy Quinn, Windy Hill Road. Um, unfortunately, I'm here to talk about stormwater runoff also. Mm -hmm. I think you're all very familiar with 
um, my problem. I've been here multiple times. Since the last time I've been here, I've received the township's assessment of the situation. So I just wanted to come make a few comments. I'm not here to talk about the specifics of my problem. I think there's a more root cause issue that's causing this that needs to be addressed. And I'd like to make sure that we're you know, documenting that on public record to possibly take some further action here. So I do wanna bring up a couple of facts. And, the, and the, the first one I wanna mention, because this was incorrectly captured in minutes when I spoke previously, and this assessment specifically says, I know I talk fast, I'm sorry. And you guys did save me a lot of time talking about, okay. You guys saved me a lot of time talking about common enemy, which is something I was gonna mention because I'm fully aware of that, you know, previous state law or litigation. But this assessment says the township, that you do not believe the township is responsible to install storm, stormwater measures at your and neighboring properties. This is the second time that this issue has been interpreted as we're looking for the township to come install storm water measures. That is not what the complaint or comments I'm making here are about. Specifically, when we, I'm not even gonna talk about storm water. I'm gonna talk about the permitting process in this township and what I believe led to what's happening here. A resident filed a plan and submitted a permit for a project. That project was completed. Immediately after that project was completed, multiple residents on Windy Hill Road started seeing stormwater and damages. It was so bad that that contractor had, had to come out and redo that entire project. Now the contractor talked to residents when he was there and said he can't fix the problem because there was a fence put in before the second time he came to redo the project. After it was done the second time, the project got deemed acceptable. That's what it says in this letter. It was deemed acceptable. I don't know if that means it was inspected, reviewed, and approved. I don't know what deemed acceptable means. It's a question I'm asking you. I don't want an answer now. I'd like an answer back at some other point to see, to understand what deemed acceptable means. Because in this letter, it stated that the township agrees that the project was not done per the plans. We talk about engineers, we talk about insurance, we talk about litigation and where this goes. Why is the permitting process in place if we're gonna have a project plan submitted, a permit submitted, it's not gonna be done per the plan, the township agrees it's not done per the plan, multiple residents are suffering damages, documenting it over the past 18 months, and the only answer we got initially was to go sue your neighbor because of common enemy law or lit previous litigation. So initially it was, hey, common enemy, we can't help you, go sue your neighbor. Meanwhile, you have a project that wasn't done per the plan. I don't even know if it was reviewed and inspected, but it was deemed acceptable, whatever that means. 18 months later, we're still dealing with the same problem, and now this assessment comes out, and the only answer in this assessment that says why this problem is occurring is because of increased rain events over the previous years. We're not talking about the previous years, we're talking about the previous 18 months. I've come here and stated before on record, throw IASIS, throw Ida, whatever those two big storms were in the past 18 months out the window. There are anomalies, they, don't, they can't be taken into consideration here. But there are at least six other normal storms. They're not 100 year storms, they're not 50 year storms. There's at least six more that the residents have taken pictures and videos of that have never happened before in what's happening now with this water. And the answer in here was, well, we don't know what happened prior to this project, so we really can't comment on that. But then three paragraphs later, there's a topographical map submitted from 2003 for a sewer project that says, well, we know water flowed this way in 2003 because of this map from 2003, and we're gonna rely on that, and we're gonna say that's the reason why things are happening now. But when multiple residents say it didn't happen that way, you say, sorry, we can't, we can't answer to that because we didn't see it ourselves. And then you come out and take inspections yourself that aren't at the right time because when these storms come, this water comes fast, it comes hard and it comes quick and it's gone. And if you're not there when it happens and the only time you're coming out to visit that property is three o'clock in the afternoon because that's when it's convenient, then you're missing that opportunity to see what's happening here. And I'm, I have the pictures, other residents have the pictures and videos of what's happening here to the point where not myself, another resident has already installed a portion, reinstalled a portion of fence that fell down because of water running through it so, so hard. And another resident who has his 
garage and house surrounded by sandbags to avoid this water from coming into his property. And you can say, you know, this is a matter of insurance claims and get your insurance carrier. The root cause of this problem is a permit and a plan that were pulled and approved and the project was not completed per that plan and that's what's causing these problems. So this assessment, and, and there's other stuff in this assessment that, well, I still got four minutes and 47 seconds. This Take is time. great. Take your time. <laughs> Take your time. So there, there was a visit made to this property and myself, two residents, and Tommy Ryan walked these properties. This is the most concerning thing in my entire point of being here is if somebody comes out and the residents speak and talk about what's going on and it's incorrectly, incorrectly captured and then put into public record and, and mailed the residents, we got a problem here. Because specifically, I didn't even know that their, the retention basin on the coal drive was owned on private property. I honestly believe that was public property. And during this whole process over the last 18 months, at some point, I'm in my backyard and there's, some, there's a green gator up there with two gentlemen with shovels throwing a bunch of dirt around. I'm like, wow, that's odd. What's going on up there? I'm thinking this is public property or maybe a home association doing some altercation because as I pointed out to Mr. Ryan when he was there, the water runs down, bypasses an inlet, and runs across that private property, which I now know is private property. And it's noted in this letter <clears throat> that I said an owner has recently altered an area of the property adjacent to 2953 Germantown Pike in such a way that directed stormwater away from the privately owned basin and onto 2953 Germantown Pike. There were two other residents who were with myself and Tommy when that conversation happened. That is not what I said. And this is, I wish Bob Brandt was here because he'd know where I'm going with this, with what is being written in this letter. Whatever somebody did on that property to redirect that water into that basin actually helps the residents on Windy Hill Road. And anybody who wants to come see the altercation, that was, the, the altar that was done to that property, I'll show it to you because it absolutely helps the residents of Windy Hill Road that that modification was done to the point where that resident's private property is right now suffering damages. The erosion, because that water is bypassing the inlet on that road and, and someone redirected that water into that basin where it should be going anyway, but it's not because it's missing the inlet is causing damage to that private property at that owner's expense, and it is helping the residents on Windy Hill Road. What's written in here is not true. Myself and two other residents were there when the information was relayed to Mr. Ryan, and it is absolutely wrong in this letter. And this letter is being mailed to residents and making me look like I'm blaming residents for doing stuff that they're not doing, which is absolutely not true. It's a serious problem. If you know the term, ask Mr. Brent, he'll tell you what it is. This is a bigger problem than runoff of stormwater. This is the handling of these problems, the permitting and plan processes and approvals that are happening in this township. Something needs to be done here because this letter is not the answer to this problem. And I have done everything I thought I could do in the past 18 months to keep this within the township and work within the powers to be, solicitors and engineers to fix this problem. There is not one mention in this letter anywhere of anything from a supervisor, which I don't think you should even have to do anyway, but from a solicitor or an engineer who should be commenting on this. In fact, what's in this letter is, I believe two times, I do not believe three times, I'm unable to question it because I have not witnessed it, and most agree when speaking about increased rain events over the years. Who's most? Most agree? I could go talk to 10 people tomorrow on the street and ask them if the earth's flat, and if nine of them agree with me, most people agree the earth is flat. So where is, the, where is the legal or engineering support to this assessment, which doesn't address the fact of the true root cause of the problem here? It's not rainwater running, it's not common enemy, it's a project and a permit and a plan that were deemed accept acceptable and were not done per the approved plan. Thank you. Okay. I appreciate the comments. Again, we respectfully disagree on some of, the, some of the comments that you've made. We're not gonna get into a back and forth on that specifically. Ultimately, if you feel we exhaustively looked at 
the topography of that area. You came before this board and requested that we look into it specifically. I, you came, I think it was either May or June. I apologize, I don't remember the specific meeting. We looked at this every conceivable way that we could and determined that the, the neighbor that you felt was driving all this water to your property was not. And again, I'm not gonna get into a discussion with you back and forth on that. And we arrived at conclusions that you clearly don't agree with. Clearly don't agree with, and that's fine. Like, it, we didn't ignore it. We didn't, there was no, if there was a mistake made in the minutes, Jeremy, if there's a mistake made in a letter in terms of that, nobody, there's no conspiracy theory here. You know, we make mistakes from time to time. Our minutes is an area where we certainly make an effort to be correct. I think we listed sewer instead of stormwater on one particular um, item in our minutes. But all that aside, you know, we have a disagreement on the outcome that we arrived at in terms of where the water's coming from and how to potentially address that. But it, it's, you feel it's a permitting process issue among some other things. And I don't wanna put words in your mouth. You know, you've stated it, put it on the record, totally fine to do that. This is the opportunity, you know, this is the forum that you would do that, but ultimately we don't agree. You know, we've reached a spot where we don't agree on what your conclusions are versus what our conclusions are. That's, that's an unfortunate situation ultimately, but it does, we're not just passing it off on the insurance company, you're saying we took a particular action or we have a particular process that we followed that now is causing you specific damage on your property. That's what you're saying. That's ultimately, there's other pieces there, but that's ultimately what you're saying there. So the next step in that is that you have to file a claim if that's what you think. And I'm not, look, I'm not encouraging people to do that. I'm not encouraging you to sue your neighbor or not. What we're trying to share in those particular discussions is that's the law. Like it, it's not, we as a, as a board, I can't decide, you know what, I like Jeremy. I like, I wanna help him differently than I wanna help somebody else on those particular items. But we certainly heard everything you said. We certainly got all the emails. We got all the information. When we looked at it, we did not, we didn't just say, oh, well, we'll just see. You know, we, we went through multiple rain events. We went through the files to see if we could find the original um, subdivision plan for that neighborhood to try to understand what their decision making was in terms of putting the original subdivision in place. We couldn't find that particular record, but we found a lot of other records to try to, to make some sense of what was taking place over there. But ultimately now we've reached a spot. Again, we've reached a spot where you're saying, hey, I'm not happy with the conclusion. I don't agree with your conclusion. And I'm not happy with the conclusion. And, and unfortunately that puts us at a spot of saying, okay, well the next action is for you to say, you think we did something wrong here ultimately that we don't agree with. Uh, so you have to take you know, the next step for better or for worse, is to say, I think you've done, you've caused now damage to my property and I wanna file a claim to that. And, I, and as Steve was saying, again, I, I don't enjoy doing that, ultimately. I'd rather that we have better resolutions, but that's, we've arrived at a spot where there's a disagreement and, and we're not, it's not beneficial to you, it's not beneficial to us to just sort of have, like we just sort of churn on the same thing, we don't get to a better answer, ultimately. Mr. Dole, you're, you're again addressing the stormwater runoff issue. I'm asking how the township manager it gives me legal advice to sue my neighbor because of a common en enemy. He's sharing with you literature. information. He's not telling you, he's, he's sharing with you what the law is, Jeremy. He's sharing in that, and I've shared with that, with you and, and to another resident as well. That's the way the law works. But how can you direct me to the neighbor to make the neighbor responsible when the neighbor pulled a permit, got the plans approved? If you feel the neighbor is causing the problem, Jeremy, the neighbor isn't causing we, the problem. Don't, we, we don't agree on that. We went and looked specifically to see where the water was coming with that resident. It's not driving the water the way you felt that it was. We looked at multiple storm events, but again, I'm not gonna get into, okay. uh, ultimately, there's a disagreement there, Jeremy, at the end of the day. And in terms of offering the advice, like it, you're oversimplifying to just say, oh, sue your neighbor. I mean, the law is abundantly clear. We're not authorized to go and tell your neighbor to do something differently. You're saying, now separately you're saying, I think you as the township did something negligent in terms of your permitting process. Like there's two separate pieces there in terms of that ultimately. But again, I'm not, I apologize. I'm not trying to be. No, thank you, I appreciate it. Trying to be fair with you ultimately. Thank you. Jeremy, what, what uh... As long as you've lived there, did this problem just occur overnight? Did it, did it evolve over time or just after this project was done? Immediately after this project was done and you, when this problem started. And you believe who's at fault in this? Engineer. I believe the contractor who did this job not per the plans is at fault. 
And that contractor had to come back a second time and redo the project. He did. And he still didn't, it still was not done for the plans. And, and who authorized, signed off, or approved any of that? It, it says it was deemed acceptable. By? The township. Well, that's a vague statement, but. Assistant zoning officer. Okay. So do we have. It doesn't work for us anymore. I, I'm not challenging that. I'm uh, just asking, I'm asking you a question now, sure. Chair. Do we, do, we re, do we get Joe Nolan involved as far as relook at the plan? Um, no, do we need a, because we have. I mean, we, we've, we've, <laughs> we've ultimately, we've looked at all pieces of it from every conceivable direction. You're ultimately saying there's an issue with the plan. There's no, there's no, further, there's no further action to take relative to the plan. The plan's not causing the issue. We made a determination on, in terms of the water that the, the plan is not causing the issue. This is where there's a disagreement. The contractor's fault. Is he liable? Uh, we don't know. That's a question. Yeah, I, I think Mr. DeLaw is saying that this is due to increased rain events. We need. That's what's in the letter. We're not going to litigate it here in the meeting in terms of that. I mean, I, I hear what you're saying. I mean, there's. Well, you either agree with the assessment that it's due to increased rain events, or you don't, because that's what the letter says from the township. The assessment right. says it's due to increased rain events. It says other things in the letter as well, but I'm not, again, I'm not gonna go through line by line with you on the letter. Thank you. I appreciate the comments. Do you have anything else to add, Steve? I don't, I'm not here what you're saying. It's not. It, I, I, I think we need to look at it. How's that? I think we need another opinion. Just like medical, I think we need another opinion. That's my comment. Okay. Rick, I think my comment would be that for you folks sitting out there, the Palmer issue is an easy, I don't want to say an easy issue, but an easy issue. These are the tough issues that we have to deal with as a board. You know, it, it, it's like a family issue. You know, you can you got to work every day and take care of your business, but you make a decision one way or the other. But these, these decisions we make here affect our neighbors, and they're the tough ones we have to make. And it, it's not easy. We have to listen to all sides. We have to listen to the professionals and then come up with a decision we may not like, uh, but it's following, the, as Rick said, the course of law. And sometimes your, your gut says you should go that way. But when you sit back and look at the, the documents, the rule of law, you have to make a decision that maybe you're not happy with. But it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, that's why we ran for office, to try to, try to be an arbitrator. So thank you. We'll have to take a look. Lou, I don't have an answer for you in terms of that. So I, Again, my other comment yeah. is not all doctors are right, not all engineers are right. So I believe we just can't leave stormwater issues like this just continually. Let me ask you, how, how about this? Just not contention. We always seem to work. The problem is do you bring it to rectify the problem? Do we have an outside source come in and say, okay, or is that the job of the insurance company, they'll bring an outside person in, rather than letting the personalities of the, the people we know um, dictate our actions. Do we look for an independent person to come in to look at some of these problems we have with the concerns of the residents? If they're questioning, I think they question the longevity of some of the people that we work here um, to try to rectify these problems. Is that what you're proposing, Mr. Betts, or what? I, it's, it's not easy. I mean, it's, it's not, but I think that we've had, we need another opinion, how's it? I don't know how you want to handle that, but I think if you're not getting results, you get another doctor. You're saying? You get a second opinion on anything. So in this case, I think this keeps going on and on. Something has to resolve. We're not going to just let them. Sure. So. Again, I'm not prepared to give you a firm answer on that right this second. Um, I'm just certainly, I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. I mean, look, we need to try to figure out a better way to do it if we think the way that we're doing it isn't, isn't perfect. But on, on this particular case. Well, I, Rick, I, I think the problem, Mr. Ryan's being put in the middle of this situation. Um, you know, we hired Mr. Ryan to be the, the buffer, I guess, between the supervisors and the residents. And 
does a good job, but you know, we, we put him in a, 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 a rough situation. I guess the question is, would it be better to answer these people's questions to bring an independent third party person to come in to look at these two, their problems they said have been going in for 20 years. So in order to rectify the problem, move this thing along. I'll make a motion that we bring a look into somebody as a third party person to come in and look at these situations that not involved in the situation to review it and file a report with the supervisors. I second that motion. And just one moment before the vote that we have a new state law that requires um, an approval from the governing body before an action item is added to an agenda which has already been published. Once again, see, we can't do the things you like to do. Life's not easy up sitting up here. We try to, we try to do things. Yeah, we don't have our solicitor one meeting, Steve, and the two of you we, go we to try. work on a, uh, No, I'll we'll, we'll work on it, okay. Fair enough. We'll, we'll work on it. You know, the, the, once again, we're bound by legal rules. rules. And, you know, Rick, Tommy tries to dance around it. Rick's doing a good job moderating the meeting. Lou and I sit there and said, easy, we'll do it. But Tommy brings us back and says, you know what? Not that easy, folks, because for we'll we work, work on, on it to we make work it on slippery slopes because if we do it for the first person, the next person is going to consider you did it for them, and it, so Tommy guides us back and said, "Guys, you have to stay on the course." So thank you, Mr. Ryan, for doing that, and but we will work on it. We'll work on it. Um, hard to believe, but we're still on public comment. If folks have public comment for our board, okay. I know you're all excited for our agenda, which is riveting tonight, but. We'll get there. Cameron Barrett, Methacton Avenue. I'm here for my answer for my fine from the fire marshal. Right. We, we sent a letter, did we not? I mean, we looked into the matter. It was a second offense, which is why you were fined at the end of the day. Okay, so can we bring up the uh, first offense? So that was in 2019, we agree? I don't have the dates in front of me. I, my understanding is that there was a first offense, it was a second offense, which is why it, it warranted a fine and why the fine remains in place. So two, two points on that. So in 2009, so have you ever drove down Skipback Pike and passed a state police officer and you're speeding? State police officer doesn't pull you over, but you get home and there's a ticket in your mail? It's never happened to me, no. It's never happened, because that would be illegal. You, the officer would have to pull you over and get, give you a citation, make you sign for the citation. So would it not be true that Dave Cornish would have to show up to my house to give me a warning for an uh, open burn policy? Correct? Again, this isn't a court of law, Cameron. I, I, so I'm, I'm just, just I'm answering just, your question. In so terms. I'm just making a point. So sure. in 2019, that's when the warning was given to me for, again, burning on my own property, which everyone does in Worcester Township, and this is selective enforcement. So in 2019, Worcester Fire Department was dispatched. This is, by the way, just after I have left the Worcester Fire Department because of a disgruntled neighbor who didn't like that I was burning, whatever, I don't care. It's, that's their problem. So... That the fire department shows up, chief officer shows up at my house and goes, oh, you're having a burn and you have water and you're good to go and left and recalled it right in front of me on the radio. And I'm very familiar with that because, as you know, I've been a fireman 14 years, 15 years. Dave Cornish never showed up in 2019, but just sends me a warning in the mail saying you've been warned and next time you're going to be fined. So Dave Cornish never put eyes on it. Dave never, Dave never did anything never looked at my property, never saw the fire, but he's going to send me a warning. So what's the legality of Dave Cornish giving me a warning, first off, on that? And second of all, back to the truth, we have a burn ordinance that you, we just fixed in, in August, I believe, if I've read it correctly on the township website. So what, what am I doing illegal that somebody else is not, just like a 40-foot bonfire on Water Street Road so when somebody called from over a half mile away and the fire department was dispatched and the fire marshal was at the party. The fire marshal was at the party and he didn't get a warning or a fine because he's buddies with them. So why do I get a fine? I've already answered you there, Cameron. You just don't like my answer. No, so, but the answer is it's selective enforcement. 
So again, there's 2924 Germantown Pike. There's a building that physically fell down, an automotive shop, into somebody else's property. The lawn hasn't been mowed in a year, but there's no warnings or fines there. I'm spending $160,000 on stonework and redoing my house on trying to make the place beautiful. I'm having a recreational burn, and I get a $100 fine, a fireman, with water in the back? So again, so I filed a right to know for Dave Cornish's credentials. This is what I got. One's a letterhead, one's a receipt. There's four papers. The other two is, and I would like a formal answer, is did, did Tommy Ryan type this or did Dave Cornish type this front cover sheet of his credentials? I, okay, we're not gonna, it's, that's, that's provided by the fire marshal. So this was provided by the fire marshal. This is his credentials. So I'm just gonna hit a couple quick keen points with, I got a minute left. Fulfilled the role of fire marshal from 1987 to 2016 in lieu of township appointed person. That's not true. We've always called the state police fire marshal, always, and Dave never investigated anything. Assisted in every significant fire investigation in Worcester Township, 1987 to present. That is also not true. I spent 10 years there. He only made about 60 to 70 percent of the fire calls in my time there. So that would just be a false statement because it says every significant fire investigation. Not true. By the way, Worcester only maybe burns at one house down a year or has a fire. So that's not a lot of uh, seniority. Assistant to the Pennsylvania State Police Fire Marshal Office, 1987 to present. I called the state police. That's not true. He's not the assistant. You'd have to have a bachelor's degree in fire marshals to be an assistant to the state police fire marshal. That's not true. They have no idea who Dave Cornish is, minus the, a state trooper who's been local for 15 years knows who he is. Attended several arson investigation classes from 1970 to present. That's not true because guess what? The only thing I have from Dave and his credentials is respect and harassment awareness for employees two years in a row. So the only thing I'm worried about is not getting grouped by Dave Cornish. So if you want to see credentials, this is credentials. This is a binder full of credentials. So I would like a month, to come back next month, and you to reinvestigate the fact that I got a warning in 2019. Dave Cornish never showed up to my house. And then Dave Cornish shows hey, up. Cameron, Ed. Cameron, there's no more to talk about. It. You got, you received a warning in 2019. You got five fined in 2021. Yeah. There's no more to, there's no more to investigate. No, but there is. So did you ask Dave Cornish? We're done. You had done. your con We are. Dave Cornish your did not show up comment. to my house in 2000. Your public comment is done, and you're not going to come and degrade one of our personnel. That's not. We're not going to discuss that here in a public meeting. If you'd like to discuss that offline, then no, we can have a it's conversation. It's going to be public because we're going to make sure that the Worcester Township residents, and this is a recorded video. That's right. An unqualified fire marshal in Worcester Township who has zero qualifications. You've to had an opportunity marshal. to make your public comment. No more. He has zero qualifications. You're done. Do any other supervisors like to speak? Just asking. Wreck your chair. I realize that. I respect that. But it's not appropriate for him to come and degrade no, no, a no. staff employee in any way, shape, or form. If you'd like to discuss that offline, that's fine. It's not appropriate to harass and selectively enforce Worcester Township residents, especially when there's buildings falling down Cameron, in we Worcester disagree and they're on not that. warned of. We fine. disagree. You got a fine. We're not removing, I'm, I'm not authorizing any removing of the fine. I'm comfortable that you were warned and you received a second notification which resulted in a fine. I would, like I, to see you, I would like to see you collect that 100 bucks. That's a challenge. Cameron, as I said last meeting, uh, I get disheartened when I watch the school board, school board meetings. I think you take time to come here and I will tell you next week or next meeting, we'll discuss this we have to have a special meeting to discuss this and give you an answer by next month, okay? So as Rick said, there's certain things we can do and can't do, so we have to look at this, but I, I, we're not gonna keep, uh, we're not gonna kick the can down the road. I would really look into the 40-foot flame crab party that Dave likes to attend every year. Thank you, Cameron. Moving forward, do we have any additional public comment for the board? Uh, you've already had your public comment, Harriet. What I, would what I would ask you to do is call the township office and ask 
for whatever parameters you need to include in terms of anything you want to file. I don't have an answer for you on that. So if you could call, we can clarify that for you. Do we have any additional public comment at this time? All right, seeing none, we get to move forward to the agenda. So first item on our agenda are our official action items. We have our consent agenda. First and foremost, does anybody wish to remove any items from the consent agenda? Okay. No. Nope. Hearing then, then, I would uh, request that somebody make a motion relative to the consent agenda, please. I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda, treasurer report, bill payment, and uh, October 2021 20, business meeting minutes. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any public comment regarding the motion on the floor? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Next item on our agenda is the 2022 budget. And this is going to be a motion to advertise the proposed 2022 budget, but I believe that Nicole has some information first before we do that. Okay, as far as taxes go... The budget includes no new taxes and no increase to existing taxes. Worcester Township's real estate tax rate is proposed to remain at 1 20th of 1 mil, which is presently the lowest municipal real estate tax rate in Montgomery County. For personnel, at this time, the Public Works Director doesn't believe an additional full-time laborer will be needed in the coming year. Our current complement of full and part-time employees will meet our needs in 2022, we will revisit this issue again as we prepare the budget for 2023. Likewise, an additional employee isn't needed in the admin department. But just like the number of employees in the public works department, the number of employees in the admin department must be regularly assessed to ensure we will be able to meet our obligations. This may change over time. For services, there's no substantive change proposed to the township provided services in the coming year. For the general fund, first and foremost, this is balance. At this time, the EIT, our primary revenue, is projected to receive 2.86 million. The budget includes 2.72 million in EIT in 2022. The, bu the budget assumes that real, real estate transfer tax will remain steady in the coming year. The budget includes $375,000 in RETT in the coming year, and 657,000 is projected this year. This number assumes the transfers of existing residential properties, the transfer of 3.3 units per month at the reserve and no transfers of commercial properties and large tracts of land, which historically have occurred on an infrequent basis. As to expenditures, health insurance premiums will not increase in 2021. This is made possible by the use of rate stabilization funds earned by the township's positive claims experience with the multi-municipal nonprofit trust for health insurance to which we are a member. The budget includes a 5% increase to our annual operating contribution to the volunteer fire department to $167,000 and retains a capital contribution in the amount of $100,000. This number does not include the cost of workers comp coverage that is provided by the township as is, as is required by state law, nor does, it, does this number require, nor, nor does this number include Act 205 pass-through aid to, to the department's relief association, which is budgeted at approximately $81,000. In addition to providing additional financial support to our volunteer fire department, the township is working to support those employees who serve as volunteer firefighters during the weekdays for many years, the township has permitted its employees to respond to fire and other emergency calls during the workday. Two years ago, the township funded a monthly stipend for those who volunteer to answer the call for help, and the response has been tremendous. At this time, six township employees serve as volunteer firefighter. The proposed 2022 budget includes the contribution of the monthly stipends. Lastly, the general fund will transfer dollars to the capital fund at the end of the year. This revenue will provide for needed capital projects like our annual road program. The transfer amount will be refined in the coming weeks as we adjust the budget to reflect receipt and expenditure estimates. 
but at this time, the transfer is projected to be around $1 million. Under the capital fund, we'll undertake sizable capital projects in the coming year. At the top of the list is the annual road program. The township will continue to provide an augmented resurfacing program, which will help keep our roads in good condition, maximizing the useful life of the network. The capital fund will provide $541,000 toward the road program, which when coupled with dollars from our liquid fuels fund, will provide an $874,000 road program in 2022. And remember, this does not include soft costs like design, bidding, and inspections, or many of the smaller fixes made by our public works department throughout the year. In addition, the capital fund will fund three sizable culvert replacements on Hollow, Woodland, and Weber roads. Lastly, the capital fund will provide for the replacement of public works vehicles and equipment that have reached the end of their useful life, including the replace replacement of a 2008 dump truck, a 2008 sprayer spreader, and a 2012 gator. For the sewer fund, in 2017, the township contracted with a new wastewater operator, and since this time, operations at our two wastewater plants and six pumping stations are running very well. As you recall, our contract provides for the direct billing of sludge removal, testing, and chemical purchases. To date, the arrangement has proven very effective in lowering these hefty expenses. As to sewer rates, the budget presently includes a 0.5% increase to residential rates in 2022, which translate to an approximate 22 cent per month increase for each home on the township system. A 0.5% increase to commercial sewer rates is also proposed. The sewer fund provides $608,000 for capital improvements throughout the year. Just like our roadway network, the sanitary sewer system requires regular upkeep to maximize the useful life of its many components. This number includes ARPA-funded improvements to the Valley Green Wastewater Treatment Plant. For our state liquid fuels fund, annual increase in liquid fuels allocation under Act 89, the so-called gas tax bill, ended three years ago. Since this time, the township's annual allocation has de decreased by 5% when controlled for the roads added to our inventory. The estimated 2022 allocation was received last month, and it's approximately 2% lower than that received this year. For many municipalities, the annual liquid fuels allocation is the annual road maintenance budget. Our community does not adopt this approach. Worcester does not assume that the annual liquid fuels allocation is adequate to meet our real road maintenance needs, an approach that is more important now more than ever. As such, we budget additional dollars in both, in both the general and capital fund to meet this obligation. For next steps, this evening, the board will consider authorization to advertise a 2022 budget for the required 20-day public inspection period. The budget will be available at the township building and the budget will also be posted to our website. The board will then consider the 2022 budget for adoption at its December 15th business meeting. That's it. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, for those who have not been to the last few township meetings, this is actually the third um, cycle on the budget we had in September. We had sort of a first reading, second reading was in October. So now we're at the point where we need to advertise so that we can adopt the budget next month. Um, first and foremost, does anybody have any specific comments they want to make regarding the budget? Uh, I know we've covered a lot of the ground in the last couple of meetings, but does anybody have any particular comments on the budget? <laughs> Rick, I think the only thing that <clears throat> Charles question is the legal bills that, you know, we have budgeted uh, money, but I, I think that, you know, we look at our solicitor, but really there's two lawyers fighting this case on behalf of the township. One is Mr. Brandt, and then you have the zoning hearing board lawyer that we don't appoint, if the, but he's still there fighting for the residents of the township. So there's quite a bit of money going into that, and I, I guess only because I've been called by people, and I'm, I'm saying this because this isn't the first war we've been through as a township. Right. I, I sat here for about two and a half years with the lights at the high school football field, and it was my opinion by looking at the law even before it got started, we were going to lose. But we chose to fight that case. And we spent two and a half years fighting that. 
And if you go to a lawyer and say, will you fight this case for me? As long as you have the money, he'll take the case, and he's willing to take your money. He may not win the case, but he'll put up a fight. Right. And, you know, so we as a township are spending money to defend the residents of Worcester and their concerns. People are saying, hey, you have to help other people out with what they're trying to do. That's not the township's issue. The township has a, a, a solicitor. We say we have two solicitors, one for the township and one for the zoning hearing board that's working on this. Others that cho choose to hire a solicitor, they can do that, that that's great. But the township people are looking at the, the rule of law and working with the instruction of the township to do that. If other people choose to hire a lawyer, uh, we have no, we can't contribute to that case. Uh, it's up for private donations, but I just want to assure the residents of the township that we are spending a lot of your money with our solicitors to fight this case. Um, as I said, it's not the first time we've been through this where you bring an outside source in. Right. And they... It's uh, almost tough to budget for it, Frank. Yeah. It's just kind it, of a blank, and I would hate to say it's a blank check, but it's... You saw how quickly we got to 75,000 and we're still- We haven't even scratched the surface yet. We're still arguing There's about no, paper No clips. conversations back and forth yeah. yet. It's just, Mr. Ryan, just paperwork being pushed back and forth? Yes, uh, the Court of Common Pleas will hear uh, this matter at the end of November. And that's where the money's gonna start coming in. That's where the lawyers will start having to earn their keep where it'll go ching, 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 rather quickly. And we have the budget for that from the township's perspective as far as your money being spent for that purpose. So that's something we take very seriously and we weigh all aspects before we make a decision. So I, I think that that's really the only rub that we have. We usually we do pretty good with budgeting, but this is something that wasn't anticipated. Right, it's a, it's a little bit of an outlier in that right. regard, sure. Okay, Lou, any comments on the budget in particular? I do not. Okay, then I will entertain a motion if somebody wants to make one. Make a motion, the 2022 budget, motion to advertise the proposed 2022 budget. Okay, so it's been moved and seconded. Is there any public comment regarding the motion on the floor? And again, the, yes. You need to come up so we can get um, your, your name and then we can just hear you on the recording because it is being video recorded. My name's Ken Hoffman. I live on Dell Road. I just basically have a question. I know uh, Mr. Quigley said about uh, how expensive the lawyer fees are and stuff. Uh, in the effort to not raise taxes, would money be taken from other areas of the, the budget to like help offset the uh, lawyer fees to fight this Palmer fiasco? So the short answer is, is we have adequate liquidity, money, to pay for different things. What we, when we put the budget together, we tried to give the best sense of here's how we think we're gonna spend the money, but that doesn't represent every dollar we have. So there's money that could be allocated if we budgeted a certain dollar amount and exceeded that. It's not, we're not limited from continuing to spend if it's an appropriate expense. We just typically try to budget well. You know, we try to give people a, a really clear indication of where the money's going, and this just is a, is a line item that we budget for, but it's a little bit of a gray area when you start to get into these types of cases. We just know that from the past. Okay, okay. but to make it real simple for me, because I'm a simple guy, the bottom line is we're not going to run out of money to fight this. For, it's not going to be an economic decision. Okay. Correct. Okay, so money can be moved. You might Correct. have to cut back on stormwater or... Don't, don't say that in this meeting. I think you heard the feedback <laughs> on stormwater. We're going to fight stormwater hard for everybody. Um, make get that on the no. Short answer is no check is going to bounce to the lawyer if we need to continue to fight the issue. Okay. Just, yeah, it's, it's just an issue that we all have a fiduciary responsibility to the taxpayers with the money, and Worcester has money, and I think probably the lawyers know the Worcester has money that we have money to spend. And we spent money in the past fighting lawsuits, but it's just an issue that really, we're really sitting on the sidelines at this point. I mean, the township, I, I think Mr. Ryan, as he said, we're just looking at the letters going back and forth, asking for information from both sides. And it just adds up rather quickly, just from right. 
who's in, who's out. There's been no testimony. Uh, it's just nothing meaningful at this point. backyard right now. I think it's backyard bickering between the people, and I think lawyers like that. Hmm. I'm glad our lawyer's not here tonight, but uh, <laughs> so we about, like our lawyer. It's about billable hours, and you know, the, be honest with you, the further it can go, I'll go back to the football lights. Yeah, 23 nights I sat here, and after the second night, I said, "We ain't gonna win." It, it's the look at the law. The law says it, and the judge was never discussed what happened. He said, we're going to win. We're going to go see the judge. Went and saw the judge. The judge said, you guys go out there and settle this. You don't want me to rule on it. He talked talk to the judge for maybe 30 seconds. And out you go. And we lost. But we had to we had a prove we could beat the law. And the law won. In that case, Tommy, did you have something to add there? I, I yeah. feel like I cut you off there. S State law allows municipalities to set up an operating reserve um, for expenses just like this. Many municipalities don't set up an operating reserve, a so-called rainy day fund. We do. And in fact, we fully fund that to the maximum amount allowed by state law. So those dollars have been set aside in a reserve account just for a purpose such as this. So yeah, yes, it's just an, issue, yes. <laughs> just an issue that we're essentially signaling the side. We, the board, don't, that's what people don't understand. It's beyond us. It's, it's between the zoning, not beyond us, it's between the zoning hearing board and the Palmer people. And it may just end up before a judge. So we're sitting there making sure everything's done right. You know, we're, we're sort of like the, the big brother in the, the group. Uh, where the counselor here make it dot in the I's and cross in the T's, but this negotiation back and forth, uh, it could go on a long time. It depends who has the deepest pockets, I think. And uh, that's, that's the issue. Thank you for your question. Thank you for your comment. We Thank appreciate you your, it. Thank you for your answers. Is there any additional public comment regarding the motion on the floor? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Next item on our agenda is resolution 2021-28, and this is gonna be a resolution to appoint the assistant township manager as the applicant agent for an application to the Pennsylvania Emergency Management Agency for Tropical Depression Ida damage reimbursement. Stacy or Tommy, who's got some info uh, on this one? I got it. Okay. Um, so uh, for we to, in order to receive uh, federal funds uh, that were allowed for Ida, we need to, we've done the first step, we've requested assistance. Um, the next step is to approve this resolution. So as we do go through the process um, that someone can sign off on this um, as we go through it. So that's basically what this is for tonight. Gotcha. So no guarantee of money, but no next guarantee. step in our process that ultimately there was stuff with Ida and there's an opportunity for potential reimbursement. So we got to cross the next T and this yes. is the next T to cross. <laughs> yeah, it'll be a long process. So. Fair enough. It certainly makes sense to me. Does anybody have any specific questions on the uh, item? I do not. We like to see other people's money. Other people's money. We do like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll entertain a motion then. Motion to, pa to pass resolution 2021-28 to appoint the assistant township manager for emergency management agency, uh, tropical depression, Ida damage reimbursement program. I'll second that. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any public comment regarding the motion on the floor? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Next up is other business. Does any board member have any other business they wish to bring before the board at this time? No. <laughs> save it. I'll save it. All right, fair enough. Moving on, we got public comment. Does anybody have any additional public comment they wish to make before the board this evening? Seeing none, we'll move on. Motion to adjourn. Thank you all for coming. As always, we appreciate your attendance and your comments.